Tomorrow, Mrs May uh, and the uh, permanent representative of the United Kingdom government in Brussels will deliver at 12.30 p.m. our time, Article 50 declaring our intention to kick-start the process which will lead in two years' time to a negotiated uh, withdrawal of the UK from the European Union. Um, Mrs May has told us not to talk about divorce, to use the uh, analogy that uh, seems to me in my mind quite apt. She thinks it's uh, uh, unwise. I think it's a sensible uh, metaphor. Uh, we wait to see whether it is a happy or a protractedly unhappy and uh, unpleasant divorce. We wait to see. One thing I think we can all agree on, there's a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, the process is a process in which there are all sorts of outcomes, uh, some more palatable than others, and I think everybody agrees, whether they are in favour of us leaving or in favour of us remaining, that we are engaged in an uncertain process that involves, to some degree, a leap in the dark. What we do know is that the House of Commons is composed in large part of members of Parliament who supported in large part Remain. 74% of MPs across the House supported Remain and 26% of MPs supported Leave. Small majority of Conservative MPs, 56% supported Remain. The Labour Party uh, was very much in favour of Remain, uh, with only 7 of 20, 222 Labour MPs supporting Leave. All parties in the House of Commons formally supported Remain, with the exception of the Democratic Unionist Party from Northern Ireland and the one then UKIP MP, who comes and goes, as we know, as he wishes. And since the people voted on uh, June uh, last year, there has been a series of debates and the government decided to trigger Article 50. With some advice from the Supreme Court, a bill was produced and it went through Parliament. And MPs, although 74% supported Remain, 26 supported Leave, MPs overwhelmingly supported the government's recommendation following the people's recommendation that Article 50 be triggered. An indicative, Labour vote, indicative Commons vote held on a Labour motion uh, uh, supported a majority of 373 with only 75 votes against. The third reading of the Brexit bill had a majority of 372 with only 122 against, mostly Labour MPs, the, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the Scottish Nationals Party, and the one member of the Kenneth Clark Party, the only Conservative opposing the proposal. And then in discussing Lord's amendments, having rejected all other Commons amendments presented to the bill, there were majorities of narrow majorities of 48 on EU nationals' rights before the negotiations and on the rejected amendment on, quote, holding a meaningful final parliamentary vote on any deal after the conclusion of Brexit, a majority of 45. So here we go. We are to leave. Uh, MPs, it's worth saying, voted overwhelmingly for the European Union Referenda Act in June 2015 by 544 votes to 53. So they asked us what to do, and the people following the national conversation, however unclear or unsatisfactory it may have been, decided that they would make a recommendation by the narrow or substantial, depending on your judgment, vote of 52% to 48% in the referenda. The referenda was explicitly non-binding. It's worth noting that, of course, we in Britain have no experience of national referenda. Only three referendas nationally in the history of our island, particularly local and national ones in Scotland, Wales, and in London on subjects, on, on local government matters. But we've only ever had three national referenda. The one on 2020, in 2019, excuse me, in 2011, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, which was on uh, uh, reforming the House of Commons, uh, um, uh, was uh, 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 binding. This one isn't. But why have MPs voted to trigger Article 50? I think for the most part, we can conclude thus far, is that most Remain MPs, even should they see themselves as representatives, Burkean's notion, a Burkean notion of representative, that they owe their judgment, not the slavish uh, follower of their constituency, if they don't see themselves as delegates, I think largely consider themselves bound to respect the outcome of the referenda, and Parliament has the duty to enact in some way the will of the majority of people who wish to leave the EU or at least reform our relations. The status quo, as far as the majority of Parliament, is no longer uh, up for negotiation. I think that uh, uh, helps to understand the position. 
It's an easy choice, of course, if you're an MP who's a Leave MP representing a Leave constituency, and for those few Remain MPs representing Remain constituents, if you want to follow your judgment, your own opinion, your conscience, as some did, and a harder choice, of course, if you are a Leave MP representing a Remain constituency, and a Remain MP representing a Leave constituency. And research has shown, although we, uh, we voted in the referenda in larger geographical uh, uh, voting areas, uh, so research suggests that, a, a considered uh, an educated guess, suggests that 61% of constituencies supported Leave and 39% supported Remain, which is a larger majority than that, a meaningless majority, of course, because the vote was simply a per capita person vote voting. So what explains this process? Well, I think, as well as the willingness of Parliament, the Commons, to uh, enact the will of the people by respecting the outcome of the referenda, I think that partisan politics, it's never very far from our politics, is it not, explains some part. Labour is in favour of tr triggering Article 50, but is in favour of then trying to influence the process by which we leave. They do so because, although Labour was in favour of uh, 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 remaining, a large number of Labour voters and a large number of Labour constituencies, particularly north of, the, north of London, outside of what we now tend to call the metropolitan elite, uh, uh, which of course involves other urban areas, uh, make it difficult. So Labour is in the difficult position of having to represent the interests of Hampstead, which voted to stay, and Hull, which voted to leave. This gives the party a difficulty. The Liberal Democratic strategy, I think, is relatively straightforward. They were in favour uh, in favor of a referendum and against a referendum. They supported uh, uh, leave and now they are, supported remain, of course, and now they have set themselves up as the EU party de jure par excellence as they see it a way in which they can claw back from the electoral hammering that they received as a result of their participation in the coalition government expressed in the 2015 election. The SNP, of course, are voting for Scotland, for Scottish independence, and they think, and having today triggered their uh, own desire in the parliamentary vote today in Scotland about the move towards a second independence referendum following the European Union decision uh, uh, taken by the UK citizens, they are in favour of pursuing their objective for independence by using the EU issue. Conservative party loyalty and ambition and party line voting may well explain some of the process. So politics are at work, and as we go forward in the difficult process ahead in the two years of uh, negotiations, which are going to be a terribly difficult and uh, 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 um, protracted process, fraught with danger and difficulty, I think we will see partisan politics at work. But I think that most parliamentarians will have uh, at the forefront of their mind the wish of the people expressed in the referenda and be following public opinion, which, of course, as we know, is tracked by opinion poll and by um, uh, 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 electoral outcomes. What now going forward is Parliament's role? I think there are a series of them. I've identified six, which I'd like to share with you, if I may, given the fact that you know, my guess is as good as yours. But this is, I think, the process. Well, first of all, Parliament enabled the referenda. They asked us to decide. Secondly, Parliament triggered Article 50, which it has done. The now going forward, Parliament has the following responsibilities. The first is to scrutinise the negotiations, to hold the government to account by questions, statements, select committee investigations. Fourthly, to advise on the negotiations, to try to influence the opinions of the government and our negotiators. I think in that regard, MPs, and I'm going to explain in my conclusions why this is, that MPs will influence the government, not instruct. They can instruct, but I think the way in which our parliamentary politics works, the way partisan politics operates in the House of Commons, means that I think we can expect that MPs will influence, not instruct. Influence can be significant. The government was not minded to produce a white paper before we discussed collectively in Parliament, the triggering of Article 50. It did so because it was the will of the parliamentary party, particularly conservative government backbenchers, who wanted one to be presented, and the government acceded to that demand. Governments operate on the basis of anticipated reaction. They respond. They can't ignore Parliament. They can't uh, 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 coerce it as much as they want. They have to, uh, fifthly, agree the deal, ratify the agreement, 
And we ask ourselves, will MPs approve the deal before it is done or ratify a deal when it is agreed? We don't yet know. Parliament will have a vote, Mrs May has promised, but what type of vote remains unclear. And Parliament, of course, can prepare for Brexit. My conclusion is that the UK Parliament is a reactive legislature. It usually, because of the partisan nature of its uh, 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 dealings, it can support, amend or reject legislation presented by the government, but it cannot usually propose alternative legislation of its own. The House of Commons in our parliamentary system has two key, often competing functions. The first is that it supplies and supports the government. That is the role of the 51% of MPs who are Conservative MPs who we the people returned with a majority at the last election. But as well as supplying and supporting the government, it has also to check and balance that government. Should those two conflicts, two functions conflict, then usually the government majority will choose to supply and support the government rather than check and balancing it, balance it. We will see what the Commons does in regard to Brexit. It will have a vote, but at the moment your guess is as good as to mine as to what vote it wants. The Commons has the nuclear option that it can pull the plug on the government, but partisan politics suggests that the history doesn't mean that that is likely to happen, and we need to see. But government will have to listen to Parliament. Parliament is going to scrutinise the process of the negotiations. It's going to try to influence that, and we the people will do that as well in our voice and votes in the two-year process as we go forward. And of course, the news media and commentar the commentariat will play a role too. But Parliament is part of the process, but I do think that the royal prerogative the right to make treaties by the executive will be the way in which, and Parliament will probably be asked to ratify a treaty that has been agreed rather than agree a treaty that is then presented. And that means that the government very much will remain in the driving seat, assuming that there is no election, which is unlikely to happen before June 2020, after, before which time the process will have been concluded. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.